Today's scripture reading comes from Nehemiah chapter 5, verses 1 through 6. Now there was a great outcry of the people and of their wives against their Jewish brothers. For there were those who said, We, our sons and our daughters, are many. Therefore, let us get grain that we may eat and live. There were others who said, We are mortgaging our fields, our vineyards, and our houses that we might get grain because of the famine. Also, there were those who said, We have borrowed money for the king's tax on our fields and our vineyards. Now our flesh is like the flesh of our brothers, our children like their children. Yet behold, we are forcing our sons and our daughters to be slaves. And some of our daughters are forced into bondage already, and we are helpless because our fields and vineyards belong to others. Then I was very angry when I had heard their outcry and these words. This is the word of God. Uh, we're continuing on in our series through the book of Nehemiah. And I think we're at the fourth sermon today, and we're going to be talking about Nehemiah chapter 5. And uh, this is basically called expository preaching. So basically what it is is uh, we just go through the Bible and uh, we let the Lord pick the topics that he wants to speak. So, uh, you know, on Monday, I don't sit there and go, hmm, what topic should I preach on? What topic does the church need? I, I don't want it to be kind of like personal, but I just, I just let the Lord lead me. So, um, you know, I just kind of feel like this is probably the best way to speak where uh, we're just letting the Lord speak what he believes is the word that he wants our church to hear. So, uh, you know, <clears throat> if we talked about, uh, as we were going through the book of Nehemiah, uh, we talked about prosperity, okay? So somebody was like, what's Nehemiah about? It's about prosperity, right? Don't you want prosperity? Amen? Amen. Yeah, right? It's, it's talking about prosperity, blessing, uh, joy, hope, peace, love, thanksgiving, uh, enjoying life, right? Don't you want to enjoy life, right? So that's basically what Nehemiah is about. But the problem was, the, uh, the, the Jews, the, the nation of Israel, had no prosperity. They were miserable. They were, uh, they were having a hard time. They were unhappy. They were struggling. Uh, they were uh, discontent. And, and Nehemiah basically says, well, the reason why is because you guys have no walls. This, uh, no city can be prosperous without walls. Now, you know, why are we connecting that? Because that's what Proverbs does. Proverbs says there's people in this world who live life as if they have no walls, walls, and that's why they're not prosperous. So as we're going through the book of Nehemiah, uh, God is teaching us through this book, how can we have prosperous lives? And you know, uh, when I say prosperous, I don't mean like you know, uh, $100 million and you know, nice car and you know, uh, you know, uh, like uh, crazy social media fame. That, that's not what I'm talking about. Uh, what I'm talking about is joy and peace and hope and love and thanksgiving and, and just really enjoying this like, wonderful life that God has given to us. And so Nehemiah says, the reason why you struggle with prosperity is because there's a lack of obedience, because you think obedience is for God when actually it's, it's, it's for you. It's, obedience is for our blessing. Um, we haven't really found our supernatural compassion. We haven't really found that place where we've been really convicted and go, man, I think this is where the Lord wants me. Um, we ignore the ordinary. So we are not faithful in the ordinary, so we miss out on the extraordinary because the ordinaries lead to the extraordinary. Um, you know, we fill ourselves with doubt and we don't fight our doubts. So for some of us, we live in a prison of doubt and we live in a prison of fear. And so we're trapped by, by the enemy so that we can live this abundant life that God has called us to live. So now we're, we're coming to chapter five, but um, you know, uh, I, 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 I missed the point last, uh, last sermon because if I gave that point, uh, it would have been way too long and I've been trying to shorten my sermons. I, I, I don't know if you noticed, but I have noticed and uh, I've been very blessed by myself <laughs> that uh, my sermons are shorter. Now, some of you knew, you guys might be like, man, that's short, what the heck? You, you don't want to know the old me, right? So, you know, my, the, the old me, like, you know, actually, you know, used to uh, preach uh, a little bit longer. So, you know, uh, so uh, we're going to go through chapter four a little bit. So, you know, uh, in, at the end of chapter four, uh, Nehemiah ends kind of with this charge. So this is the practical application. So Nehemiah says, when I saw their fear, I rose and spoke to the nobles, the officials and the rest of the people. Do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your houses. Okay? So, so Nehemiah says, you got to fight. So, so that's, that's the conclusion. So remember how great and awesome God is. And in light of that, fight for your family. Okay? And, you know, as a pastor, 
when I look around sometimes, rather than fighting for our families and our children, unconsciously, indirectly, we, we hurt our family. And the most surprising thing about that is we actually hurt them with our love. Now, what am I talking about? You know, in the Greek, there's four words for love. So there's eros love, which is kind of this like sexual, passionate type of love, attraction love. There's phileo love, which is kind of this like brotherly friendship love. There's agape love, which is generally translated to be this unconditional love uh, that God has for us. But there's a fourth love that you know, the, 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 the Greeks used to talk about called the storge love, which is actually this like family love, the, the, the love that parents had for their children. And, and I kind of want to focus on this storge love because this storge love is actually a really powerful love. In fact, uh, it's really powerful. You know why it's powerful? Two reasons why it's powerful. Uh, this storge parental family love is very powerful is because number one, it's unconditional. It's an unconditional love, right? Uh, you know, there's really nothing your children can do that's gonna stop you from loving them. Amen? That, that makes sense, right? There's really nothing. There's, you know, uh, there's huh, a lot of things we can do for, them to, for us to not like them. <laughs> but you know, there's nothing you can, they can do to, you know, to stop our unconditional love for them. In fact, there's a phrase, right? You are, you know, uh, uh, shoot, I think I forgot what I was, what I was gonna say. But uh, you, are, you, know, you are the only person that your mother can love. Did that make sense? But you know what I'm trying to say, right? Yeah, only person that loves you is your mom, right? You are so unlovable, no one loves you but your mom, right? Uh, if you guys find a good quote, someone say it to me. I've been, blank- <laughs> I've been blanking a lot. I-, I blanked out so much during the first service. Uh, but, uh, so it's unconditional. But second thing is this, it's a hopeful love, right? You have great hopes for your children. So it's powerful, right? Like, like, like think about how powerful our store gay family love is. Uh, it's unconditional and it's hopeful. You, ha- you have great hopes. You, you want your children to grow up and, and you know, just uh, uh, accomplish all the things that you know, God wants to give them in life, right? I remember uh, you know, uh, uh, my youngest daughter, she was dribbling a basketball, and uh, I'm gonna be honest, I was so amazed. <laughs> I was so amazed, right? And I remember I posted on Facebook, I said, is the WNBA her future? <laughs> and all these dumb people, I had like 200 likes, <laughs> right, leading me astray. You know? <laughs> so hopeful. I was so hopeful. My oldest daughter, she won, a, she won a piano competition when she was little. I mean, she didn't win. She got honorable mention, but to us, that was winning. <laughs> right? She won. And I remember me and my wife were driving home and we're like, Juilliard? Right? You know? <laughs> it's so hopeful. Our love is so hopeful. Right? So it's unconditional and it's hopeful. How powerful is a parental love? You know what the problem is? problem is your parental love that's filled with so much hope and unconditional love is actually the number one reason why our children are so hurt. You know, uh, at our church, we do this thing called inner healing. And we're going to have an inner healing conference in uh, December where uh, one of our AMI pastors is going to come out and lead it. But when I went through inner healing, and uh, when you talk to people who talk about inner healing, uh, they say, and this is a conservative estimate, okay? 60 to 70% of hurt that we carry around in our lives is because of our parents. Right? 60 to 70, right? Uh, and this is conservative. Somebody was like 80. But how is that when their love is so powerful? It's unconditional. It's so hopeful. How can that love hurt us? Right? You see, the problem is not love. The problem is that our love is distorted. And when you have a distorted love, 10, 20, 30 years down the line, you, uh, down the line, you see this unfruitful, this bitter fruit that you're not happy with. Why is that? I think the reason why is because our passionate, uh, deep love that we have for our children is not shaped by God's truth, but rather by these three false beliefs. And so here's false belief number one. Somehow, we have been lied to that our children belong to us. Brothers and sisters, let me say this. Our children do not belong to us. Our children belong to God. Amen? Right? 
You know, uh, our church, we do infant baptism, and that's one of the dedications. That's one of the confessions. You, you know, you, you bring your child up here before the presence of God, and, and you know, we, we baptize them into our community, and one of the reasons why we do that is our confession that our children belong to God, and we are nothing but stewards for a season. Right? Do you believe that? Here's false belief number two. Our love is based on giving our children what we missed out on. Right? So a lot of our love, we, we want to give to them because we, we, we didn't experience it. We missed out. Uh, you know, there was this hole in our hearts, especially Gen X parents, right? Uh, you know, I'm a Gen Xer too. Uh, you know, uh, like we had the roughest childhood known to man. Right? We were latchkey kids. Our parents ignored us for 10 to 15 hours a day. We lived on our own. I remember I woke up, made myself breakfast, went to school by myself, stopped by Ralph's Market, picked up dinner by myself, went home, cooked that dinner, you know, in the microwave, <laughs> and then, you know, sat there, watched TV, sometimes did my homework, played with my dog, and then my mom would come home at 8, 9 p.m. and was like, oh, how was it today? Did you do good? I was like, yeah, I'm fine, I'm fine. And that, that was me, right? You know, uh, we used to be called latchkey kids. I don't know if I shared this with you, but, you know, like, my mom didn't tell me. You know, I, I remember, like, random people would knock on the door, and I, I just open it. <laughs> right? You know, they're like, yes, can I help you? Is your, is your parents home? No, they're not home. No one's home. You can, like, you know, you, know, you, could, you could come in and rob us. It's okay. Right? I mean, you know, that, that's just basically how I live. So, you know, I missed out on a lot. You know, you know as, as I, and by the way, I'm single parent, too. I bless every single parent here because I know how hard it is, right? Uh, you know, but, um, you know, I, I know how hard it is. And then, you know, as I grew up, I look back and I go, what the? Missed out on that, missed out on that, missed out on that, missed out on that. And then what do I say in my heart? I go, my children will not miss out on anything I missed out on, right? And, and, and you think that's a good thing. But here's the problem is you become blind to what God wants to give to our kids, because you become so focused on what you want to give to them out of your passion and your desire, you become blind to what God wants to give them. And brothers, let me say this, God loves our children so much more than we do, amen? God loves our children so much more than we do. God has a greater plan for our children so much more than we have for our children. But we become blind. In fact, we don't even ask God, Lord, what is your will for our children? Because we're so com committed and, and, and passionate by giving them the things that we missed out on. We're so obsessed with giving them. We become so obsessed with our values that we want to transfer to our children, the, 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 the dreams that we have that we want to become our children's dream. Like we just want to give them all these things. And in fact, we don't even know. Like we create these unconscious demands that, that our, our, our children that are so sensitive to us uh, pick up without us even saying it. Um, you know, if you're a psychologist, you should read this one story in the Bible about David. So David is in a cave, and as David is in a cave, he's looking at Bethlehem, the, the place where he grew up, and he looks at a well. He, he looks at a well in Bethlehem. And I guess, you know, I'm just kind of uh, looking into it, but like uh, the water must have been so good, right? Because he's looking at this well, and then all of a sudden, he just sighs. He goes, ah, that water in Bethlehem. He just sighs. He doesn't tell his mighty men to go get it. He doesn't say anything. He just sighs. You know what the mighty men do? They risk their lives almost to the point of death. Some of them probably got injured to get David that water from the well. Right? How crazy is that? All because he sighed. Right? And some of you guys are like, how does this have to do with parenting? Parents, you may not tell your children certain values, but you sigh. <sighs> Harvard. <laughs> right? <sighs> Doctor. Actually, no, you don't sigh like that. You sigh the other way, right? <sighs> right? I'm not going to say it because it be offended to somebody here. <laughs> Your children are sensitive to you. It picks up on you. Creates unconscious demands. Right? You know, um, there's a lady named Lily Zhang. Uh, she's a four-time Olympian in ping pong. In fact, uh, uh, ping pong is actually one of the sports I really like seeing in the Olympics. It's so crazy. 
And uh, I saw her play, and I'm like, man, she's so good. Four-time Olympian, right? And, uh, uh, you know, decorated hero. So she comes back to her parents, and I think this was written in the Wall Street Journal. Her parents said, hey, uh, now that you're done, can you get a real job, please? Right? That's not even a sigh. <laughs> Right? You know, we, we say, oh, we're not like that. You know, it takes generations for certain values to be removed. So what happens? It unconsciously becomes our children's identity and worth. You don't even know, but they're trying to live up to our standards. And then they think they're not good enough. I thought I was actually a pretty good parent. Because, you know, I would always say, hey, you know, um, I go, you got to please God, do what God wants. I don't care as long as you work hard. It's all good. And then, you know, one of my daughters, right, they're like, you know, stop talking about us. <laughs> Too bad. <laughs> <laughs> right? You know, one of my daughters was like, you know, it's crying and crying and crying. And I'm like, why are you crying? And she's like, oh, you know, like, uh, I don't know if I can get into college. I can't believe, you know, I'm like, I'm like, dude, it's okay. Don't worry about it. You know, I'm okay with that. Don't worry. And then she's like, you know, no, I really feel like you want me to. I go, I never said that. When did I say that? She goes, I feel it. <laughs> you know what I was doing? I was sighing. I was sighing. Right? And you know what concerns me? My, I don't care what college my kids go to. I really don't, right? Um, I didn't go to that good of a college, and I turned out okay. In fact, some of the most successful people I know, some of you sitting here today, you didn't go to good college either. <laughs> and you know who you are, and you're awesome, right? Um, you know what concerns me? The greatest influence of my kid's life, me, is unconsciously creating a standard for them that's making them want to please me, which ultimately now they're going to transfer it to every other human being, creating performance orientation. But you know what concerns me the most? I'm concerned that my children are going to waste this one life that God has given them, living their lives to please people and not God. Parents, if you have young children, right? Um, you know, parents, okay, parents, okay? Uh, can, you not, can you not say this to your children? Or, or don't say it as much, okay? You know, parents, they always say this to their children. Are you happy? Are you happy? Right? Like, you know, I don't even want to say show of hands right now, right? Are you happy? Don't say that. Or don't say that as much. You know what you should say? I've said this before. Glorify God. Glorify God. I know, I, you know, that sounds crazy, right? But what you're doing is you're making them God-centered. Right? You're making them God-centered. You know, uh, false belief number three is we raise our children child-centered, always seeking their happiness. Are you happy? So we create self-centered children, and we're raising them to fail, all because of our love. We're raising them to fail. You know why? Because when they enter the real world, which basically means they leave us, right? They, they leave us. They go to college. They, they get their first job. And they're going to rudely realize this world is not about them. You know, so these young people, they have the hardest time handling entry-level jobs. Now, now I'm going to be honest. We had a hard time handling entry-level jobs. Entry-level jobs, by its definition, is really bad. That's why it's an entry-level job. But that's the place where you have to be faithful and grind and suck it up and humble yourself so that you can move up through the ranks, right? But, you know, uh, when, when you know, you're constantly like, are you happy? It's about you. It's about you. These kids, they, they look at their bosses and they go, why are you not mentoring me? Right? And then all these bosses are like, what are you talking about? I hired you to do a job, Right? And then they go into college, and they're like, why is my college not helping me, like my mom? There's no resilience. And the biggest problem is we mess up our children with our love 
Why? This unconditional, hopeful love that we have for our kids because it's not shaped by God's truth. We mess them up thinking that we did a good thing and we don't know the bitter fruits of it until our kids turn 20 years old, 30 years old, and 40 years old. So what am I saying? Basically what I'm saying is parents, especially you know, for those of you who have little children, by the way, praise God, right? We have so many little children here at our church, right? I bless this church, man, right? You know, as my kids are getting bigger, you know, like uh, I, 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 you know, I miss that age, right? And, uh, you know, and if you have little kids, they are not yours, they're God's. God has a greater plan for them. God loves them so much. Uh, you know, uh, God wants to bless them. So let your passionate, unconditional, hopeful love be shaped by God's truth. That's all I'm asking. Let it be shaped by God's truth. Ask the Lord, Lord, what do you want for these precious children and help me to be a steward for a season and to lead them in the way that you want so that they may be blessed so when they grow up and they think about us, rather than cursing us, they may bless us in Jesus' name. Can I get an amen on that? Right? So, you know, this next generation, they don't have to do so many inner healing, right? This next generation, like, maybe inner healing will be gone, right? So, you know, that's basically what Matthew chapter 7 says. You know, Jesus says, like, uh, even messed up people can love. E- even, even messed up people have unconditional, hopeful love, but that love means nothing. That's basically what Jesus is saying. So, you know, Jesus is saying, or what man is there among you who, when his son asks for a loaf, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, he will not give him a snake, will he? If you then, being evil, you're messed up. You, you're not shaped by God's truth. God's word is not a standard of your life, but you still unconditionally love your kids. You have great hopes for them, and, and, and it's going to be all messed up. Why? Because you know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more, how much more will your father who is in heaven give what is good to those who ask him? So brothers and sisters, are you fighting for your children? Remember, that's what Nehemiah 4 says. You got to fight. Remember how great and awesome God is. You got to fight, fight for your children rather than hurting them with our unsanctified love. Okay. So, you know, uh, I'm done with my last sermon. Let's go into this week's sermon. Right. Uh, So, uh, so now the enemy, like it's done, like uh, enemy is attacking from the outside and it's not working. So now the enemy changes their strategy and begins to attack from the inside. So enemy uh, attacks from the outside, repelled, now the enemy attacks from the inside and we see in verse one, it's really clear, it says this. Now there was a great outcry of the people, the suffering and cry and complaint And it says, and of their wives against their Jewish brothers. So now there's division in the community of Israel. There's there's uh, there's discord, and 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 the reason why is um, there was a famine during this time, so uh, people were struggling for food. Uh, Persia increased their taxes because they were going to war, so they had to pay more taxes than before. And Sambalad, who was the most powerful leader during that time, because he hated what was going on in Israel, he cut all his business ties, and he said, don't help the Jews economically. So basically, you know, all of this is happening, and who do you think suffers the most? The poor. So as the poor was suffering, uh, the poor had to borrow money from the rich. So, you know, it says this. For there were those who said, we, our sons and our daughters, are many, Therefore, let us, gra- let us get grain that we may eat and live. There were others who said, we are mortgaging our fields, our vineyards, our houses, that we might get grain because of, our fa- of the famine. Also, there were those who said, we have borrowed money for the king's tax on our fields and our vineyards. So they couldn't pay the tax. They couldn't overcome the famine. Uh, you know, they couldn't overcome losing business from Sambalot. So they're running out of money and all their children, they couldn't feed. So what they did was first they sold their field, they sold their houses, and they still needed more money. So they went to their Jewish brothers who was richer and they asked for a loan. And in the Old Testament, within the nation of Israel, between brothers, these are all brothers, they're 12 brothers that came from the line of Jacob. As they, as they um, you, know, uh, you know, were in this community with one another, one of the laws is this, when you give a loan, you don't charge interest. You just give it to them, right? You just, you just let them borrow it, and then in their good time, they're going to pay it back. Problem was, these Jewish brothers charged 
an extraordinary high amount of interest on the loan. And when they couldn't pay it back, this is where it gets crazy because you know, uh, you're not supposed to, you know, you're supposed to wait, but when they couldn't get it back, they took their land, they took their houses, and they even took their family members and made them slaves. So this is what's going on in the nation of Israel. So we see this, it says, now our flesh is like the flesh of our brothers, our children like their children. So it's basically saying, hey, we're, we're one family here. Like we all come from one father, Jacob. Yet behold, we are forcing our sons and our daughters to be slaves. And some of our daughters are, are forced into bondage already and we are helpless because our fields and our vineyards belong to another. Right? And this is happening. Like, it, this is happening in the Old Testament church. Right? This is happening in the family of God. Brothers and sisters, when the enemy fails externally, chapter 4, the enemy attacks internally, chapter 5. Why? Because the enemy doesn't like the prosperity that is coming to the people of God. And the enemy wants to do everything to take that prosperity away, even if it means using other believers to hurt you and to take away your prosperity. Right? And enemy attacks our unity as a church. And once again, chapter four, right? You gotta fight. Remember how great and awesome God is. And you gotta fight. Fight for your uh, spouses, fight for your children, fight for your parents, fight for your friends, fight for your church, fight for your community, right? Fight for this nation. So how do we fight back, right? Uh, let me kind of give you three things because, I, you know, I used to think we used to really understand this and take this for granted, but, you know, the more I pastor, the more I realize, like, oh, my gosh, people really don't know this, okay? So first is this. Brothers and sisters, we have to remember the truth. The truth is the most important thing. Without truth, everything else is, 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 is a sham, right? Our lives have to be based on truth, right? We can't let any lies come into us. It is the truth that actually sets us free. So what is one of the truth? You know, the enemy makes you believe that the church is a museum for saints, not a hospital for sinners. You think, you, it, the enemy makes you think, like the church is the place where like, Perfect people exist. And, and let me say this, brothers and sisters, we're not perfect. Like, you know, uh, I, I, I used to be like, oh, you already know this, I'm not even gonna say it, but I feel like I have to say it because I feel like some of us, we don't know. Do you know that it's impossible to be in a close relationship over a long period of time and not hurt one another? It's impossible. It's impossible, right? Marriages, don't you agree? <laughs> it's impossible. It's impossible to be in a long-lasting relationship and not hurt one another. Right? And, and, and the problem that I see is we have good relationships with people for years, and at that one weak moment, we get shocked, disappointed. We break that relationship. We can't handle weakness. Brothers and sisters, let me say this. I just feel like I'm saying a whole bunch of common sense things to you, but I feel like I have to. We should never define a man or a woman by their one weak moment. Can I get amen on that? Amen. Right? Because then we stop being a community of grace. Right? We define a man or a woman over the pattern and the trajectory and the direction of their lives. But some of us, we define them over their weak moment and we just can't get over it. Right? And, and, and let me make a caveat. Some weak moments are horrendous, okay? So that's, that's another you know, um, uh, topic. I'm not talking about that. But I'm talking about things that just aren't kind of run of the mill and we just can't get over it. You know, the Bible says that when you see a weak moment as a Christian, as a believer, you're supposed to cover that weak moment with love. Right? That's what the Bible says. When you see weakness, the natural response of a Christian is not to be disappointed, discouraged, angry, offended, hurt, but to cover. Right? Uh, above all, keep fervent in your love for one another because love covers a multitude of sin. 
Christian love has to cover. Right? And uh, here's number two, right? So our church, we are not a museum of saints. Right? Uh, we're a hospital for sinners that is being healed and renewed every day by the power of the Holy Spirit. In fact, if you're going to be with me, you know, my hope is to be here for 20 years, right? Lord willing, please pray for me, right? You know, one year down, woohoo, right? 19 more to go. <laughs> Can't wait to get out. <laughs> I mean, not because of you, but because of the burden of the position. Yeah, yeah the position is really burdensome because I just want to be faithful. Yeah, I love you. But you know what I'm saying? Like, just, like I just want to be faithful. You know, uh, uh, what would kill me is unfaithfulness. But I'm not perfect. Right? And I'm going to have my weak moments. And I hope you won't be shocked. But if you see my weak moments, you'll be like, oh, we need to cover him and love me more. Right? As I love you more. Yeah. So, uh, second, uh, we have to fight back with humility. We have to fight back with humility. Right? Um, you know the number one destroyer of community is? It's pride. Pride. Number one destroyer of community. Pride. How do you know you're prideful? You know, uh, <laughs> I, I think we don't understand what pride is. Right? Uh, you know, uh, we do these Saturday dinners called Savor. Right? And uh, I kid you not, we've done, I think, 31 Savor dinners. Isn't that crazy? Yeah, 31. I've, I've been to 31 Savor dinners. It's crazy, right? 31. And not a single 31, no one went first to get food. Right? Not a single one. So I'm like, hey, let's eat, let's eat. No. Right? And it's come to a point now where I say, you go first, you're humble. Still, everybody's like, ha, ha, pastor liar. <laughs> Right? So I go, okay, I'll go first. So I always go first. And recently I'm like, I'm the most humblest man in this room. <laughs> right? But that has nothing to do with humility. You know what pride is? Let me define for you what pride is. Pride is you get easily offended. You are easily hurt. You are easily disappointed. And you are easily discouraged. That's pride and you can't overcome, right? That's pride. Um, and that weak moment of that other person is so overwhelming to you that you can't handle it, right? You're like, I gotta leave. I gotta get out of here. It's pride. You know, um, when I used to do marriage counseling, um, like, uh, you know, I would meet with the couple and, uh, I'd be like, hey, so what's going on? How can I help you? And uh, usually, uh, you know, one person's like, yeah, I have a lot of problems with my spouse. You know, this, that, this, that, this, that, and I just can't, you know, I just can't overcome. And now, let me make the caveat. Some of it is horrendous, okay? So I'm not talking about that. But others are like more, you know, run-of-the-mill, garden variety, you know what I'm saying? Like, you know, things like that. And so as I'm listening to one person just be like, you know, I'm disappointed, I'm angry, I'm offended, I'm hurt, uh, you know, uh, I can't overcome. You know, uh, now I'm like, oh, you're the prideful one. You know who are the most prideful people? Victims. If, when you think the world is out to get you, you think everything is against you, you think everybody's hurting you and disappointing you and you feel disillusioned and cynical of life, you have so much pride. But the enemy has deceived you into thinking that you're the victim when you are the most prideful. Right? See, pride is you can't overcome. You can't overcome the hurt, the disappointment. You can't overcome the discouragement. You can't overcome that one weak moment, right? You can't overcome this. And you know what humility is? Humil humility is not letting someone go first in the food line. Okay? You know what? Today, we're going to have food, okay? We're going to have food today. Uh, if you go, not everybody. We're not, we're not going to feed everybody. But if you sign up for pre-encounter, we're going to have food, okay? All right? I want you to race and go first. 
all right? And whoever goes first, you are the humblest person at the Church of Southland Chino, okay? No, that has nothing to do with it. It has nothing to do with it. You know what humility is? You know, you know like some people, I'm like, wow, that's a humble person. You know who that is? That person overcomes their hurt, disappointment, discouragement, the weak moment, and continues to forgive, reconcile, and love in the power of Jesus' name. Can I get an amen on that? That's humility. And what has happened to our society that we define humility and pride as going first in the food line? <laughs> this food thing is really bad. <laughs> Next saver, someone go first. I'm tired of going first. I'm tired of being humble. I'm tired of being humble. Uh, you got to look at the cross. You know, they call Jesus the humble king. He's the humble king. You know why? Because we hurt him, we discouraged him, we disappointed him, we offended him. We had the greatest weak moment of our life, and he overcame all that by forgiving us and loving us in Jesus' name. He is the humble king. The cross is a humble demonstration of his humility. So because he humbled himself on the cross, upon death itself, God exalted him as a name above every name. Third, we have to fight back with our love. We have to fight back with love. Number one destroyer of community and marriages is pride. The number one uniter of community and marriages is love. In fact, the Bible says that's the greatest thing you can do is to love. That is the great command. The one great thing that you can do is to love. But you know what I realized? Many Christians do not know how to love. Many Christians do not know how to love. In fact, uh, I, I'm going to go crazy here. I only think, I, I honestly, I, I don't want to believe this, but I honestly think only 20% of the people sitting here really know how to love. Right? We've never learned Christian love. We know worldly love, but we don't know Christian love. Some of us have been Christians here 20, 30, 40 years and nothing but spiritual infants at love. Right? You know, you have knowledge. You serve. You're a leader. Right? You know all this Bible. You went to seminary. You, know, you went on multiple mission trips, but you don't know how to love. Like, what were you doing with your life? Right? What... Like, you know, this, this is basically what Patrick Keefe, Patrick Keefe says. You know, some of us, we put our ladder in the wrong building, the wrong focus, the wrong vision, and we try so hard to climb up on it, and then when we get to the top, we realize we're at the wrong place, and we wasted 20, 30 years of our lives in this wrong area. Right? And, and that's, that's love. The building of love is here, but we're climbing up the building of anointing. We're climbing up the building of skill and talent. We're climbing up the building of leadership. We're climbing up the building of like, you know, a Bible knowledge. When, when God says the greatest thing is love. And then so we go up there and we know everything about the Bible, right? We, we have incredible anointing. And, and we're in the wrong building, <laughs> right? We're in the wrong building, right? You know what love is? Jesus defines what love is. Right? Jesus he says, but I say to you, love your enemies. You know who your enemies are? Those who hurt you, disappoint you, discourage you, uh, constant weak moments, right? And I'm not saying have no boundaries. You gotta have boundaries, but you still have to love, right? And pray for those who persecute you. Do you pray for those who hurt you, discourage you, disappoint you, right? Uh, the, the ones who have a weak moment? You know, uh, I've been practicing this, right? Do I have enemies? Yeah, I do. Like, you know, and once again, biblical enemies, people who've hurt me, right? People who've discouraged me. People that I've seen a weak moment over me. And, and, and I kid you not, brothers and sisters, I'm just going to share a little testimony. I, I obey this verse, and the more I pray, the more... Uh, the more I pray, the more I pray. You know what's really interesting? There's this one person that I'm praying. I've been praying for like a couple years now. And uh, in the beginning, I didn't want to see their face. But now I'm like, oh, if I see them on the street, I would love to go up and say hello. But then I'm like, I don't know if they're going to say hello to me, but I would love to go and say hello. Do you see how my heart has changed because I obey the commands of God? so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. 
You'll be like God, for it causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good. He sends rain, rain you need for economic pros- uh, prosperity on the righteous and the unrighteous. And then, you know, this is a dagger, this is a dagger verse. You know, when I was young, we used to call it dagger verses, where certain verses just stab you in the heart, right? It says, for if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do that? Like literally the most evil people on the face of the planet, they know how to love. Basically, Jesus is saying, you don't know how to love. If you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles, the non-believers, pagans, do the same? See, this is why the world doesn't respect the church. Because the church loves like the world. When the church is supposed to love in a countercultural way in the name of Jesus. But the problem is we've never learned. And the problem is we never committed to learn. Problem is we never trained ourselves to love. Because we've been so distracted focusing on other things of the kingdom, we missed out on the greatest thing. Let me start here, brothers and sisters. I thought this was common sense too, but I realize it's not. Love is not respect, okay? Love is not respect. What do I mean by that? If you only love those that you respect, it's not love, okay? Right? Uh, in fact, uh, let's say this together, okay, on three. Love is not respect, okay? One, two, three. Love is not respect. You know why? Okay, uh, this might sound funny, but I'm just going to say it. God doesn't respect you. God doesn't respect you. Right? You think God's like, man, Richard, I respect that guy so much. Right? Hey, Jesus, come here. Look at Richard. Right? Like, would, would God let me run the universe for one day? Right? You know, uh, I don't respect my kids. Right? Especially when they're little. I'm like, you can't eat right. You can't go bathroom right. You can't sleep right. You don't know how to treat us right. You're the most needy thing on this fifth planet, right? Like, you know, uh, right? You know, like, you know, uh, one time uh, when my daughters were little, uh, I remember I, was, I, I, dro- I used to drive a lot for campus ministry, and I came home, and I'm like, man, I'm so sick of driving. I'm so tired. And then my youngest, uh, my daughter, she's so compassionate. She's like, oh, daddy, poor daddy, right? She goes, I'll drive for you. I go, oh, heck no, no, forget it, right? You know, you're not going to drive for me, right? I don't trust them, but here's the thing. There's no one I love more. There's no one I love more. God doesn't respect you, but he loves you so much that he's willing to die on the cross for the forgiveness of your sin. Right? Brothers and sisters, let me, let me ask you, do you know how to love? Like, do, like do, you, do you know how to love? Do you know how to love according to Matthew chapter 5? Do you know how to love your enemies? Pray for those who persecute you? Or is your love based on this world? Right? And, and Jesus says, therefore, you are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. What is that? This is perfection, love. Love is maturity. This is the goal of our faith. Right? And in fact, if you serve without love, it's useless. Useless. Right? No profit, no fruit. You can speak in tongues like crazy. You can be the most gifted prophetically. You can have incredible faith and, you know, miracles happen. But if you have love, the Bible literally says you are nothing and you profit nothing. Right? Nothing. Right? So, uh, good news. When Nehemiah said this, they repented. Israel repented. And Nehemiah was like, you guys need to love one another. And Israel repented. Praise God. You know, Nehemiah says, please give back to them this very day their fields, their vineyards, their olive groves, and their houses. Also, the hundred part of the money and of the grain, the new wine, and the oil that you are exacting from them. Man, they took so much. Then they said, we will give it back and we'll require nothing from them. We will do exactly as you say. Praise God. They, they say, you know what? We really need to love our brothers and our sisters. So I called the priests and took an oath from them they would, that they would do according to this. You know, Nehemiah is so crazy. Basically, you know what he did is he, they said, yes, we will do what you said. 
And then Nehemiah is like, call a priest, call a priest, let's take an oath. Basically, you know why he took an oath? He's basically like, if you don't do this, may God's curse be upon you. Right? Aren't you glad you don't have him as your pastor? Right? Because I won't do that. Right? So Nehemiah did that. He goes, may God's curse be upon you if you don't do it. And this guy's hardcore. And, but they repented. So brothers and sisters, truth is the most important thing. You don't want love to be greater than truth. But the greatest thing you can do with that truth is to love. And I want to encourage all of you to start training yourself to grow in biblical love and to train yourself to grow in biblical humility and to train yourself and to love in a way that is contrary and different from the world. Amen? Right? Why? Because that brings prosperity in your marriage, your family, your children, your church, your community, and in all areas of your life. Um, <clears throat> let me end with this. So at the end of chapter 5, Nehemiah gives himself as an example. So he says, hey, you know, the former governors who used to govern Israel, they heavily taxed the people. So let's say, you know, the governors tax 10%. They would send the servants out and the servants would collect 15% because they needed that 5% for themselves. So the people paid taxes to Persia, they had to pay taxes to the governor, and they had to pay taxes to the servants. And, and what Nehemiah said is, I'm going to get rid of all that. You only have to pay taxes to Persia, but you don't have to pay taxes to me because I'm not going to collect any taxes. Therefore, uh, his servants didn't uh, pay any taxes. And, and Nehemiah is basically like, I love you guys so much. I, I, I really want to bless you. This is my demonstration and act of love. So, you know, uh, I'm going to be very generous towards you. And then you see that, and Nehemiah is basically saying, this is what I'm doing. He wants everybody to follow in his example. And then he ends with this. This is the last verse of chapter 5. And the last verse of chapter 5 says this. Nehemiah looks up to God and he says, Remember me, O my God, for the good things that I have done according to all that I have done for this people. Right? Remember me, Lord. Remember me. Right? Re Lord, I'm doing this for you. So remember me, Lord. Brothers and sisters, is there anything you're doing in your life right now where you can look up to God and say, Lord, remember me? And my hope for you is that all throughout the seasons of your life, that there's something that you could look up to God to and say, remember me. Amen? Right? I hope, I hope you can say, Lord, remember me. Right? Remember me, Lord. But within the context of this passage, this is on love. Nehemiah is basically saying, remember me for loving your people. Remember me for loving your people. That's basically what Nehemiah is saying. Husbands, I hope there come seasons in your life where you can look up to God and say, remember me for loving my wife. Wives, I, I, I pray you could say the same. Remember me for loving my husband. Remember me, Lord, for loving my children. Remember me, Lord, for loving the church, my friends, my brothers and sisters. And here's the promise of God. God will never forget any good thing that you have done for him and in Jesus' name. Right? And everything that Nehemiah looked up to God and said, remember me, God said, I will remember and I will reward more than you could possibly imagine. Brothers and sisters, may we be a church and family and individuals that's richly rewarded by God. And more than seeking the remembrance of people, let's seek the remembrance of God. And I want to encourage you to grow, to love. And let's not be spiritual infants at love, but let us be people who love according to the way Jesus Christ did for us. Amen? All right, let's pray.